Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. Here is a quick correction slash clarification on something that I briefly said in my last video, which a lot of people pointed out in the comments. The video is titled Be Careful with Scriptable Objects, and the goal with the video was to teach you that scriptable objects have one specific quirk where they behave very differently in the editor and in the build. In the editor, they act like persistent state, but in a the build, they do not. So if you build your game depending on that persistent state behavior that you see in the editor, then you would go crazy when you finally make a build and everything suddenly broke without you knowing why. That was the main point that I was trying to get across, but in the video I also said they should only be used for static read-only data, which is not necessarily correct. Basically I just said it quickly without thinking too much about it because that wasn't the main purpose of the video and that is indeed how I personally use them, but like many people pointed out in the comments, that is not correct. You can use them for more than just read-only data containers, you can use them for read-write, just not for persistent data. A lot of the comments mentioned an excellent talk all about scriptable objects. I definitely encourage you to go watch it if you haven't seen it. It's an excellent talk that showcases lots of interesting uses of scriptable objects other than just as read-only data containers. It's an interesting architecture, but as with everything, nothing is perfect and there are always pros and cons. Depending on your skill set, your team composition and size, it might be a great architecture or maybe it might not be. The main pro is that it's very designer friendly. If your attack types are scriptable objects, then your designer doesn't need to bother a programmer to add another value to the enum. If your designer wants to add more behavior when the player takes some damage, they don't need to touch any code. The cons are that you can end up with hundreds or thousands of individual assets in your project if you use them for every single variable, every single event. It's also not really very suitable for games with a dynamic number of units, like an RTS or Tycoon games, which happen to be the type of games that I like to make. Also, it's pretty hard to debug, it's tricky to see the stack trace. In the talk, he specifically mentions how they need to build several layers built on top of the demos in order to make this architecture easier to debug. Then there are potential performance issues due to all those layers you need to add on top of it to make it more designer friendly. And he also mentioned, in the end, the very issue that I pointed out in the last video, how scriptable objects are persistent in the editor, which he does not want. So he has another script, which then goes through every single scriptable object and resets their values so that the behavior in the editor matches the build. So it is a valid architecture with some pros and cons. And for me, since primarily I'm a programmer and I work alone, personally I use scriptable objects just like I said in that quick offhand remark. I use them solely for read-only data, like storing a weapon stats or crafting recipe or some general game config. However, like many people mentioned, it is a valid architecture, so just because personally I do not like it does not mean you shouldn't like it. If it makes sense to you, then by all means use it as more than just read-only data containers. Many people pointed out how they use them for event handling, and yep, that works. Again, personally I just use regular C-sharp events and hook them through code, but yep, screwed more objects are a valid alternative. Other people pointed out using them for variable containers and hooking UI elements, it's a very designer-friendly workflow. Someone else mentioned how you can call instantiate on a scriptable object and then you can use that just like any other data in memory. Some people pointed out how it's very useful for sharing data between scenes and yep, that's right. Again, personally for me, I just use static fields for that purpose, but a scriptable object works as well. Although someone else did point out another quirk which I had never even thought about. Since read-write access only works while the object is in memory, that means that if the object is cleared from memory, then it will lose that previous state. So if you do use scriptable objects for shedding data between scenes, do make sure you keep a reference to it all the time. For example, something that I do in my games is I make a separate scene just to handle loading and nothing else, so it acts like an intermediary between any two scenes that I want to load. If you did that, then the object in memory would be destroyed because there would be no reference to it in the loading scene. Then some people also mentioned the asset scriptable object pro, which was apparently designed specifically to help solve that persistent problem and add some more features. And also someone else posted a simple but very useful comment. When building out your game, definitely do some testing in your target platform as you're developing. Don't do it just once right before release. So yes, to further clarify what I was trying to say and what I should have said in that quick offhand remark, yes, you can use scriptable objects for more than just read-only data. You can use it for read-write access, that is a valid use case if you find it useful. Just be very, very aware of that one quirk where they persist in the editor but not in a build. So if you do use them for read-write access, then either create a system to reset all the values, just like Ryan mentioned in that talk, in order to make the editor behavior match the build behavior, or alternatively create a system to always save back the changes to a file to make the build behavior match the editor behavior. 
Also, for some more discussion on this topic, check out the game dev show that just came out. They talk about it around the 17 minute mark and around the one hour mark. Okay, so thank you all for all your comments. And let me take this time to point out that please, yep, do post a comment whenever you feel that I said something wrong or that there's more to something than whatever I said. I have quite a lot of experience since I've been programming for over 20 years and using Unity for almost 10, but that absolutely does not mean that I know everything or that I'm immune to mistakes or oversimplifying things. And this is also a great example of how when you follow some tutorial, you should always read the comments. If there is something that the instructor might have missed or something that was wrong or should have more clarification, chances are people in the comments won't point it out. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.